everyone, and thank you very much uh, for joining our third and last session of the day of the Summer Sports Forum 2021. Today at large, we are discussing the impact of large uh, sports events on economic development and social regeneration of the host city. The focus of the session is sports media engagement and impact uh, during sports events. Um, our panel today is uh, quite uh, engaging from uh, a perspective of experience. I would like to uh, present uh, uh, Nancy El Hindi, uh, first and highest Arab woman uh, take on the black belt holding Saturn Dan, working in women, women empowerment initiatives. Nancy is the country manager of the Union of Arab Banks. Uh, Nancy is also the inspiration of many women in the MENA region. Thank you for joining us, Nancy, today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, also, we have um, uh, Mr. Fakhruddin uh, Fouad Gour, also known as Dean, as I've noticed on the screen. Um, Mr. Gour is uh, um, actually represented uh, Jordan in the 1992 and 1996 Summer Olympics uh, and a three world uh, champions 1987, 1991 and 1993. Um, in 1999, he ended his career with 36 international and regional titles in addition to uh, winning all national championships so he left nothing to anybody else. And <laughs> in 1986 and 1999, breaking the Jordanian national uh, record 13 times. I don't know what else can, is there anything else left? Um, no, you said it all. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> but I think you can add, I'm uh, Mr. Willie Banks' biggest fan. I actually met you in, uh, in Osaka in the World Olympics Association meeting and stalked you in Vegas and took a picture with you and with Horace Conway. So, <laughs> so it's good to see you again. Thank you very much, Dean. And uh, uh, Mr. Willie Banks, I would like to reintroduce him uh, again for the sake of the viewers who just joined us. Uh, he is a world athletics champion, three times Olympian and former president of the U.S. Olympians Association. He served as chair of the U.S. Track and Field Athletes Advisory Committee, in addition to serving as the organization vice president. Welcome again, Mr. Willie Banks, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm most excited about this one because what we are going through put media on the spot. Three days ago, we just heard no one is attending, but everyone is attending. How would that work? Um, let's start with Mr. Willie Banks. You've been there, you stood in front of people, you performed, you achieved, you brought triumph and glory back home and that was recorded. Um, people saw it and they saw it again and again and again. Back in the days, we used the word recording now we're talking about streaming. Media industry is definitely being challenged to the core. How do you see the role of that industry um, being active in making sport events successful? Well, thank you again. I just got to say this is going to be another opportunity for sport to move the needle towards uh, a new paradigm because there's, there's no other way that we're going to find out just how creative the media can be in covering a sport. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that for years, as you all know, uh, probably starting in the late, uh, late 50s and 56, but more importantly, probably back in the, the 60s when television actually started to cover the Olympic Games live, did the world really get an idea of just how popular the sport or the Olympic Games could be? 
And in 84, when it became a commercialized uh, property and, start, and it became so rich for not only the Olympic Committee, but for the cities that were hosting the games, did we get an understanding of just how important it was for the media to be on site and to be able to, uh, to present the Olympic Games live? But we had the technological advances outside of sport, outside of the Olympic Games, uh, like, you, you know, the streaming, like you said, you mentioned streaming. You mentioned, uh, you didn't mention this, but my first opportunity to do email was sitting at the 1984 Olympic Games and shooting messages back and forth to friends, uh, other Olympians. As, as we were having the games. And I was amazed at just how cool it was to be able to talk you know, on, uh, to others uh, across the way. So that medium became very important. And, and that came at an Olympic games. So maybe to focus on your answer, I think this is gonna be a critical new step and we can just crumble under the pressure or we can step up and utilize all of the new technology available to us to make these games, you know, maybe not as fun and interesting for, for us old, you know, guys, but for young people, it can make it, you know, they can actually participate in the game in a way that they never could have back in the old days. So I'm excited. I want to see new changes. I want to see streaming. I want to see, uh, TikTok efforts. I want to see Instagram going live. I, I, you know, it's just going to be crazy. So yes, I'm for it. It's going to be up to the media uh, to change this and make it best for all of us. Sadly, they're going to restrict how many people uh, can be or how many of the media can be a part of the games. But those who will be will be representing, and I hope they represent as well. Thank you for that, and. In fact, and as I'm looking at uh, Dean to help me with this point, the media industry uh, really got through a very critical time through the past year or so in finding content due to the lack of sports events. Not even athletes were able to engage. Even when they did, the spirit wasn't there for the fans, where they are distanced, uh, they are isolated, and when they stepped in, there was fear. There was focus more on the physical aspect than the spiritual aspect of the game itself. There has been simply distraction. How do you think media should now evolve itself into an empowering tool using all the available technology that we witness these days? What should be done right? Well, I think I remember listening to Roger Federer a while ago, and he was talking about uh, someone asked him, what is the effect? Because he, he's always the most cheered uh, player when he plays anyone. And I, I believe it's uh, from his response, I can I can pull something that uh, it's really not about the media as much as it is about the athlete. Athletes are adaptable, and I, I believe that they can draw motivation from within. Uh, there are athletes like uh, Mr. Willie Banks, for example, he told me, I, I saw him really engaging all the audience. So for some, they have to have that adaptation and again, like dig inside and get it. But I don't think right now there is much more that, that the media can do uh, to influence the athletes. They will uh, use what's available, maybe something enhanced. Uh, but overall, it really, uh, again, depends on the athlete, depends on the, the outcomes. Um, and I don't think overall, uh, other than the spectators in the stadium, I don't think for billions of people, uh, the experience will be less exciting. Uh, billions of people before watched the Olympic Games uh, on on TVs. Now we have 3D TVs, we have virtual reality, we have all types of, of ways of streaming uh, to watch those uh, events. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think we do have the technology and the media required, but again, it's up to the athletes themselves. Great. And 
um, that will actually send me to reset. Um, Nancy, uh, if, if I may, may ask you about your perspective as uh, a woman in sport. How would you envision, how would you define the role of media to uh, contribute to sports success, spread, and adoption? Okay. Um, well, let me thank my um, my coach, Mr. Samir Kamal, for this opportunity to participate in this important uh, forum. And um, hi for everybody. Um, for my experience, um, um, uh, for my experience in in Jordan, especially as a first female um, Taekwondo female uh, national team. Um, uh, there were no support because we don't have the social media in that time, in that period. So it won't help the female to get their ach achievement in that time. So we start to go by ourselves and to work by ourselves and to give our word, to give our, our word to, for people. We don't have media or nobody to help us. But after, um, I think in, in 2005, we start, or 2003, we start the media. So they start to know about the female national team. We start to get uh, achievement of a uh, national team. Taekwondo, not only Taekwondo, in the sport too, we start to work hard in, on it. So the female start to put her name on the, uh, on the achievement, on the results of the sports, especially in Jordan, especially in the whole world as a female thing. So for this, I'm saying social media helped female especially the female more than male to uh, to increase her case out to let all the world to know about the female how she can do it and she can get her achievement to work on thank you for that nancy um mr banks you have been there on the decision making table it's a rounded one everyone has a say at a different point in time you have been on both sides. While the sides are not uh, are cornered, they're really rounded. There is no cutting edge. And while engaging with media, things could be exposed, things could be changed, and reality might have a different face. How would you define the role of media in empowering events to become successful up ahead, during, and right after? Wow. Uh, <clears throat> That is a that is a difficult question. It's it, it. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can make it. Uh, I guess maybe a now question for Tokyo Olympic Games. Yeah. The, the Tokyo Olympic Games, as as we said before, won't have the access. So I think the media has to. Um, they have to give access outside of their own um, sphere. So we have what is called rule 40 in the Olympic movement. And rule 40 prevents uh, um, uh, or it guards the intellectual property of the Olympic sponsors and media and so forth. So it prevents, it prevents athletes from, you know, putting logos and things that are not associated with the Olympic Games. So it's not a personal gain for them. But it also has an effect on preventing athletes from, uh, from actually participating in any types of activity, media activities out uh, during the games. So for instance, you can't use your TikTok and do something on the Olympic Games in your Olympic uniform, or you can't do a, uh, a special broadcast by yourself to your fans uh, about the Olympic Games during the Olympic Games. Those are all rules to protect sponsors and broadcasters. For these Olympic Games, if we do that, we're not going to have the flavor of the games because there's no excitement outside of the focus on the athlete. And I said, I mean, I think Dean said it best, you know, it's up to the athletes this time to, to make this game special. Um, but if they're hamstrung or prevented from, you know, exhibiting their personality and getting to their fans through the 
the different social medias that they're famous with, then we won't have a good game. This will be this will be a boring game. It'll be great for old people because we can sit in front of our television and watch like we always watch. But for young people, the people that we're targeting to help grow the Olympic movement, they're going to be like, well, shoot, I'll just watch it on, you know, YouTube. I don't have to watch it live. And I'll just watch that specific event I want to see. So there's not going to be a carryover unless the media decides to relinquish this grip it has on the, uh, the Olympic movement and allow athletes to actually engage the fans and, and, and make the games uh, relevant to young people. Yeah. I'm hearing as if you're trying to say it becomes timeless because every generation that follows will have the same feeling, will experience the same engagement, will learn or probably set new rules, but be- I, I wouldn't say that because if you say that it becomes timeless, the media will be afraid because that's their fear. If we let it, you know, they won't, they're going to say, well, that's a slippery slope. So I don't want to go there yet. I mean, I, would, I think it's great, but I think what we want to do is make an exception for these Olympic games because it's so uh, restrictive, not only for the, the fans, but also for the, for the stakeholders and also for the media. I mean, I get calls from the media here in the United States. They won't let me go to the Olympic Games. I'm like, I can't do anything for you. So the key here is this is a special Olympic Games. Let's use this as a test for how we can improve the engagement of fans for an Olympic Games. Perfect. And let's let's stop there for, for a minute. And let's, I mean, I'm willing to, 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 to debate this, but I think we need to stop there and then see how that has improved the games or how it didn't improve the game and then make rules that will protect uh, intellectual properties and broadcast, but will also allow the athletes to engage the fans. I think everybody wants that. Thank you for that. And this will also redirect us to uh, evaluating, asking, and challenging the impact of media on cities. This is the main topic we're looking at here. And how would that aggregate from a city to a country? And also in the middle, there is the community and the different communities. Dean, how do you see that impact? And how do you see the role of the city engaging with media and making it happen? Um, are you asking in general or specifically about Tokyo? Totally up to you how you'd like to answer. All right. Them. So um, I'm, I'm going to like tap on my own experience in the, the Olympics in 1992. Uh, while we were driving around in the city, we saw slogans on buildings that says freedom for Catalonia. Mm -hmm. And it was something new to me. I didn't know what Catalonia was, despite thinking I was this like whiz in history and geography. And then when I asked, uh, uh, it, apparently Barcelona was the capital of Catalonia. Uh, and they were asking for uh, freedom. And they used the Olympic Games to launch that message. And despite the, the fact that there was no uh, social media or internet back then, um, that message was heard, whether by athletes who went back and uh, asked and shared their experience or whether it was uh, uh, through the actual uh, uh, media broadcasting from the Olympic Games all over the world. I'm sure many TVs had broadcasted that message. And then when you go back to uh, Tokyo in 1964, you will see that uh, media was used to give a, a, like to uh, polish the image of, of Japan because Japan was considered one of the Axis countries. Uh, so they were showing that we are a peaceful nation. If you look at the pictures uh, from that particular uh, major event, you would see that it portrayed how nice people are. At the same time, the media was used also by Japan back then to launch their automotive uh, industry, which, were, which they were actually planning to do this uh, last year and probably will do to launch the uh, self-operated vehicles. So it's, it's been used in every Olympic to polish uh, the image of the host nation or the city or even uh, 
highlight uh, the qualities and characteristics of their people. Thank you for that. Um, Nancy, based on this, what do you think any city or every city within a country that is hosting events, whether it's at a global level or at a national level, should do in order to enable media to have a fruitful engagement and enable media to be successful in transmitting uh, the, the goodness and the outcomes of, of that event? What are your thoughts? Um, I think um, uh, for my opinion, I mean, social media has developed into a prime, um, primary uh, tool for advertising. For so everybody is using now because it's attracting a new um, new audience for the events or for the championship or anything, or uh, increasing attention for everybody. Um, it's take um, many social media we can uh, platform as Facebook now they are using Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. They can advertising all the events in the country and they can use it. So it's this impact. This is important to impact the country or the. Uh, the event, the one that we're holding. Uh, and plus it helped the organization for marketing and in a different way to marketing and communication between uh, between people. So it, it's increased this. But in, in the same time, we can say this, the social media has this advantage for this thing too. Because you know, um, now the, what we, they said, um, uh, the, the spread faster, if any word spread faster, it will, hit the bad uh, reputation we can say for the event or something like this so it will ruin everything so for this we have to be very carefully about this uh, media because sometimes it's it will take you up and sometimes it will take you down it's a great perspective and maybe we should follow on with can you share with us some of those experiences where the social media has contributed positively or negatively to a success uh, of uh, a female athlete. I'd like to be specific about that. Um, you can say, um, um, for example, we can say in Jordan, for example, um, you can say when we get a medal, so uh, the media, they put him, uh, put anybody, any female, she's a champion of, um, of the world. If she bring a medal, um, gold medal, silver medal, or something like this. But if she went the second month, for example, she went for another championship and she didn't get any medal. They will put her down that she will, she's a loser and she will never get any, uh, anything in her life. So this is what the media make for the championship. So sometimes if you can say the player, um, um, what they say, it affects the players in this, the media, it affects the players. Sometimes, like I said, he puts them a champion for the, his country and the second day he's a loser for his country. Could I, could I interject on that yes, please. that Nancy made? So Nancy, if, if that's the case, do you think then that the athlete should have the opportunity through their own following and social media to, uh, to contest the media, the general media on those statements and ask their followers to believe in them and to help support them through, you know, otherwise they have no platform to, to, to speak, right? Yeah, but of course, it's under supervisor because she has under supervision because, you know, not everybody can use the social media in a good way. I, I, can I piggyback on that also? Uh, I, I, I hear you, Nancy, because I have been put in such a situation as a male athlete as well. Uh, unfortunately, not in every country you can actually use the social media to uh, kind of counter attack. Uh, so uh, I would say would leave it at that it's not in every country but uh, for for media and athletes uh inequality is very very uh, prevalent and one of the female athletes that uh, i think the media in general harmed is caster Sminia. and not only harmed her reputation and harmed her feeling and even her own identity i i think probably media in general led to Custer Sminia, a world-class athlete, to being uh, banned from participating in the Olympics and for, uh, also for uh, being subjected to humiliating practices such as having to prove that she is not a male. So that is really a problem. However, uh, I believe that when uh, such issues are being brought to the forefront, 
they all, uh, allow people to uh, give their opinion. So whether you ask you whether you ask your followers uh, to kind of fight the fight for you or not, your your fans will do it. These days, social media enables them, and uh, they exert some power over the traditional media. I believe. Do you think then, uh, Dean, that there's a responsibility of maybe federations or or uh, leagues to protect their athletes. In other words, take for instance, the example of Miss Osaka and her uh, uh, leaving without going to the, the press conference and therefore being uh, shunned by uh, the media for not doing that. Do you think that we should protect those athletes? Should we have programs for the athletes? I think in, in the Miss Osaka's case, it's more uh, like uh, it's so individualized beyond the feder uh, like local federations uh, supervision. Um, but I do think that someone has to speak for athletes. And in her it's case, in her case, uh, uh, struggling with anxiety is not something to mess with. I think this is something that has to be acknowledged, whether from her federation or from anybody around the world. It should be respected and the athletes should not be treated as just machines that can just do whatever we want anytime we want. But is that a media thing? Is that, should the media have uh, some restrictions on its, itself? I don't think media should have some restrictions. I think that, um, they should they should be more sensitive sometimes to actual issues, not just being censored, but some issues uh, like she actually uh, talked about. Uh, it's it's not easy to be vulnerable as as a famous athlete, and she was vulnerable, and I do believe that uh, she should have been respected for that, not censored but respected. A great point. Um, a great example. And we can see the impact of media uh, more on the social aspect being prevalent, being present, being uh, um, on the spot. But I would like also to notionally address the economic impact of media on a certain city or uh, economy. And starting with you, Dean, there, uh, that nod means that you have a perspective. We are <laughs> definitely. Well, I. I it's a more that perspective. I actually learned something recently that uh, the first uh, the first Olympic Games I've ever saw, uh, like the, my first introduction into sport was Montreal, 1978, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I saw that they're like still paying off the debt that uh, that was caused by the uh, <laughs> Olympic Games. So that was a shocker. Uh, on the other hand, the example I gave a, a few minutes ago about how Japan used uh, the Olympic Games to launch the automotive industry and how they are planning to do that again during the current Olympics. Uh, uh, Germany and Berlin were the first to uh, use the, utilize, I want to say, the uh, Olympic rings for propaganda purposes and generate, uh, you know, uh, generate uh, uh, revenues for their economy so it, it is being used however i'm not sure how successful every country is i think some countries are not necessarily uh after even though it's a big chance to make money i think for some country national pride polishing the nation's image like uh, germany for example wanted to polish their image uh uh, even Mexico wanted to show the world that we are capable of hosting major events. So uh, I think it really, at the end of the day, it depends on uh, how successful are you in generating revenues and in boosting your economy. Um, Willie, do you see that more as a local city sized type of an impact or do you think it's more of a GDP hitting figure? Well, as you know, up until 1984, the Olympic Games predominantly was a, a government uh, function or a government sponsored event. And then in 84, uh, Peter Uroff and his crew figured out that through commercializing the games, uh, selling everything, 
they were they were able to make you know billions of uh, billions of dollars uh, th through through these uh, contracts. So it changed the face of the games. It went from a uh, a fiscally irresponsible event to a, a fiscally smart event just in, in four years. So we started getting a lot of cities bidding because they found out that they could actually uh, make money. But it was, I think it's local more than a, 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 a government or regional thing. And well, let me take that back. It's local, the economic benefit for that city. But going back to Dean's point, it's, it's government, it's a, um, it, it, it's kind of a propaganda. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a bad, I, I don't want to use that word, but I mean, I, I understand it is propaganda, but I think it's promotional for the country. They can use it for the pride of their people, for the pride of their culture, to educate the world on the value of, of that particular country and what it has to offer to the world. So there's some good parts to it. And, you know, we look at it maybe as some bad parts, but truly large events like the Olympic game and world cup can change a, a country uh, positively uh, over a, a seven year period that we can't do in any other fashion. We can destroy a country real easily through wars and famines and viruses. But to build a, a country in seven years, no other tool can be used to do that. So that's how amazing this is. You are really getting the audience stirred up to ask questions. So this time I'm going to open it up for anybody and everybody to jump in and ask. And I can see that uh, Mr. Samir Kamal has a burning question he would like to contribute to. Samir, yeah. please. First of all, nice to see you, Nancy. I, I think you are in the USA now, yeah? Yeah, in Chicago. Oh, so enjoy your time. <laughs> <laughs> me, me and Dean in Dubai now. We are, uh, we are traveling for a business trip. Okay. And really good to see you also, of course. So uh, I, my question comes uh, out after Dean and uh, Willie, where they were talking about the impact of the media, how they can, uh, the host city can promote the, their their message or what they want to do but at the same time there is a counter media and I know that some countries other countries they are using the social media or the traditional media or whatever media to damage the image of the organizer of the host city so I, I would like to hear a little bit from Dean and a little bit from Nancy and a little bit from Willie because I'm sure you you know what I mean about that okay so thank you um, yeah, I, thank you for asking that question. That was uh, kind of lingering in, <laughs> in my head uh, because uh, I, I remember in 2008, I was in the United States uh, during the Beijing Olympics and I thought the opening ceremony was fascinating. I loved it. And uh, the, for example, the fireworks was like something I've never seen. Next day, I was surprised that the media was not talking how great it was. Rather, it was talking that it was digitally enhanced. They wanted to take away from China that they were so successful in hosting such a big event. And another thing was that seven years old uh, girl that sang during the opening ceremony, um, the NBC wrote, uh, the real singer, seven years old, uh, her face was chubby and she had crooked teeth and wasn't good looking enough for the ceremony. So she was replaced by uh, another girl who is prettier, and she uh, and uh, she was she had the stage present, and uh, media and the social media went berserk. Probably over a million uh, views, uh, YouTube uh, sharing on uh, on uh, social media, thousands of dislike, and it brought disdain to actually uh, people looked at uh, China in a very unfavorable way. So that's, that's one way that I, I personally saw that, uh, yeah, uh, media could be used to actually 
tarnish the image of, an, of, of a hosting nation. Thanks for that, Dean. Willie, would you have a comment on that? Yeah, th th those are very interesting uh, comments, Dean. So fortunately, I've, I've, I've done a lot of research in this area, and I found that prior to the games, uh, the media has a tendency to be very negative. They will attack the city, the country, everything. They just, they, I, I don't know, maybe it sells, they used to say it sells papers, but maybe it sells media. I don't think you're going to see it as much uh, as you did in the past. But I mean, even today, you know, if you go back to um, the Mexico City, they had the violence in Mexico City. They had the riots. They had the shooting of the, of the college students. That was huge. But what we think about the Mexico City games, we think about so many world records and, and the, 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 the protests on the, on the uh, podium. And you don't think about the deaths of all those people prior to the games. And then after the games, the media made... Mexico City as if it was like almost, um, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it was amazing how things went from horrible to, okay, this is pretty awesome, to this is the greatest thing. You take a look at uh, uh, going to Brazil, uh, to Rio de Janeiro. Prior to the games, the media slammed Rio for the lack of the facilities. The Zika virus is going to kill, or the Zika yeah, virus from the mosquitoes are going to kill everybody. Don't go. And, the, and, and a lot of people didn't. But I went, and it was great. I got around. There wasn't a lot of crowds. You know, it was fantastic for me. And there was no Zika problem. It was all made up. It, it, well, it wasn't made up, but it was blown out of proportion so that they could sell their media. And, and, you know, yeah, afterwards, there's a problem. But that's because Brazil, I think Rio wasn't prepared media-wise to fight the international media. And now we come to the Tokyo Olympic Games and this buildup and how horrible things are. But I, I, would, I would put a dollar on my desk against your dollar, Samer that says that after these Olympic games, people are gonna say the Japanese people handled this so well. It was, it was amazing in the face of adversity, how creative they were. You know, it's gonna be wonderful because, and, and I think the world is gonna feel better because the virus is gonna slowly start going away. And they're gonna say it was because the Olympic games was so fantastic, <laughs> who knows, but, so it, it, this is a pattern with, the, with major events. First you kill it, then you have it, and then you adorn it. So hopefully uh, we'll, uh, this pattern will become a little bit more um, stable over the coming years. Thanks for that, Willie. Um, Nancy, you've been through that experience. Would you possibly share, share with us some countermeasures that should be packed into your belt so that you're, you're well prepared for such counterattack. And you are a martial arts. <laughs> um, for me, as a female, I was saying not as a country, as a female yep. in Jordan, yep. when we start with the coach Samer, I start as a female, first female in Jordan, um, as a national team, everybody, you know, why the female martial arts, you know, this is for men, not for women, not for girls. She's not allowed to do it. After we go in around seven years, I think so the coach summer, seven years, they start to accept the female team, the national team. But still, till now, when I go to anywhere, they ask me what you're playing. I say, Taekwondo, oh, you don't look like a guy. This is the first thing they think about me, that I don't look like a guy. Because martial arts is for men, for, fe for male, not for female. This is the problem with all the female in martial arts, I think. And also, I know that you are uh, having an Instagram page. You are empowering women, and I'm following that page. Uh, you are doing a good job. Thank you. So, how is, how is the feedback on that uh, page? 
thank you. This is what we're having. We're ha I'm having to do. I'm trying to do it to be stronger, not strong, because the empowering the empowerment woman. We have it. All the countries they have it, but we don't have the woman, the one in in the positions like in banks, in um, in federation, sports federation. They don't have the head management. They don't take female. Always male in the whole world, not only in Jordan. It's only 25 percent in the whole world. The high management as a female. So we're trying to work. I'm trying to work to. Ex to express for the people that the female, she can do this and she can be stronger and she can get to the head management. Can I, can I say something, Nancy? Yeah. Um, in 1989, I won a badminton tournament in Jordan and I took the cup home and my father was shocked. He said, isn't this a girl's sport? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think uh, those social expectations uh, go both ways sometimes, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something really wrong. It sends very, very wrong message. Yeah. Thank you for your answers and contribution. Uh, I wonder if there's anyone else who might have a question for our panel before we conclude. All right, um, Dean, Willie, and Nancy, what a great session. What a vibrant session. And thanking you is never enough for such engaging uh, us with knowledge, experience, and lively topics. God bless you. Thank you all. Everyone, thanks for being here. And with this, we conclude our forum for the summer of uh, 2021. We look forward to meeting you again soon. This is your host and moderator, Cal Salem. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Before, before we go, I want to say something also. Uh, Khaled, uh, Khaled, he's like uh, an engineer. He worked with IBM. Uh, he's, he's really a, an experienced person, and he graduated from Harvard also. He is like uh, a pioneer person, a social person. He's a father of Taekwondo student. He's a Taekwondo also. He is second degree black belt. His kids are high belts. Uh, he's a highly respectful person uh, in, in Mississauga. And also he's chairing, uh, he's the chair of the executive board uh, of the AXA, of our association. Uh, and his contribution is so big. Also, I would like to thank uh, the team, Khaled Mizyat behind the screen, uh, Marcelo, Wael, Sabrina, uh, Musab, all, all my uh, team, they were really helpful. And always happy to see you all uh, here with us. So I'm so glad to meet you again. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. thank you. What a great conclusion. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are. God bless you all. Thank, thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amr. See you. Thank you. See you.